Welcome to the South Central Texas Winter 2018-2019 Climate Outlook Webinar. My name is Brett Williams. I am the climate focal point here at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Austin, San Antonio. And we will go ahead and get started. So before we jump into the winter outlook, let's do a quick review of what happened in fall. Um, we saw below normal temperatures across the region this fall. You can see here on this image here on the right, mean temperature percentiles. Most of the area was below average with a few pockets, especially out west toward Del Rio, seeing much below average temperatures in the fall. More importantly, what we saw was well above normal precipitation in the fall months. You can see here on this image on the left, we saw much above average to even near record wettest falls across much of south central Texas. And this effectively erased our drought conditions that we saw from the summertime. And looking at our four climate sites of San Antonio, the two sites in Austin, Camp Mabry, and Berkstrom Airport. In Del Rio, San Antonio saw its wettest fall on record with Del Rio coming in at second wettest fall, with the two Austin sites coming in at 12th and 15th respectively. And then looking at temperatures, San Antonio came in at 16th coolest with Del Rio at 18th coolest, and then the Austin sites at 40th and 17th coolest respectively. So again, generally cooler than normal and much, much, much wetter than normal across the region. And we actually had quite a bit of, of heavy rain events that impacted the region this fall. In September, we were historically wet. San Antonio had its wettest September on record with Del Rio at its fifth wettest and then Camp Mabry at its sixth wettest September on record. It was actually the third wettest month ever recorded at San Antonio with 16.86 inches. And you can see the map here on the left is total monthly precipitation with the departure from normal on the right. You can see here basically from uh, the San Antonio area, Bear County, especially northern Bear County, and then points west toward Uvalde, uh, Bandera County, Medina counties. This was kind of the, the bullseye of the precipitation for this month of September. And then moving on to October, the heavy rain continued. Uh, we had a period of heavy rain. Uh, this is the 10-day estimated rainfall from the 14th of October through the 24th of October. And you can see this corridor here across the hill country where we had 10 to 15 inches of rainfall uh, in this period. Uh, most of that fell on the 15th into the early morning hours of the 16th of October, especially right here into the Llano River Basin. And this produced a massive flood wave uh, on the Llano River and we actually had the second highest crest on record at the Llano River at Llano. This is the hydrograph from that event. And on the morning hours of Tuesday, October 16th, it crested about 40.17 feet, well in the major flood stage and just below the record uh, stage of 41.5 feet. All that water made it into the Highland Lakes and made it all the way down to Lake Travis, which saw its fifth highest crest on record of 704.39 feet. Here are some images from that event. This is a aerial photograph from the Llano River at the Highway 16 bridge in Llano, Texas on the morning of Tuesday, October 16th. And you can see just an insane amount of water here. Uh, if you're familiar with this area, typically there's a little uh, dam right here and it's just basically a trickle of water coming down past the bridge and on downstream past Llano. Uh, so just an insane amount of water right here on the Llano River at Llano. That water made it downstream and ended up overtopping Ranch Road 2900 Bridge near Kingsland and destroyed that. And of course, um, all the silt and debris from the uh, from the flooding inundated the Austin water treatment plants. And the city of Austin had a boil water notice in effect for about a week because of this event. So uh, a very significant, very highly impactful flash flood event that we saw, a uh, flash flood and river flooding event that we saw up in the Austin area and the Hill Country area back in the middle of October. Uh, November was much drier, thankfully, um, but uh, on average, a very, very wet fall across the region. So looking ahead to the winter time, um, this image here on the bottom left is severe weather reports by month. And severe weather is rare during the winter months across our region. Uh, you can see it's almost non-existent for the months of December and January. You see a slight uptick once you start getting into February as we start getting into the spring severe weather season. But in general, not a whole lot of severe weather across our area in the wintertime months. On the right here, these green vertical bars is 
uh, average monthly precipitation. These are the monthly normals from the 1981 to 2010 climate period. And you can see that winter is the driest season of the year, climatologically speaking. Temperature-wise, our coldest days of the year are from late December through mid-January, so we're coming up on that here shortly. And then looking at snowfall climatology, uh, again, this is the climatology for the entire period of record here when I'm looking at the snowfall. At San Antonio, any kind of measurable snow, so that's greater than or equal to a tenth of an inch. Uh, we typically see an event like that once every 3.8 years. When you're looking at snowfall greater than or equal to one inch, we see that on average once every 6.4 years at San Antonio. For Austin, those come out to be every 2.6 years for measurable snow, and then once every 4.6 years on average for snowfall greater than or equal to one inch. And at Del Rio, Del Rio is pretty similar to San Antonio with measurable snow falling on average once every 3.5 years, with snowfall greater than or equal to one inch on average every 6.4 years. And if you guys will recall, Last year on December 7th, we had a pretty significant snowfall event across much of the region. Um, did impact both the Austin and San Antonio climate sites. Uh, San Antonio International Airport received 1.9 inches of rain, or I'm sorry, 1.9 inches of snow, which was a pretty significant snowstorm for the San Antonio area. So now looking at the 90 and 100 day rainfall as of December 10th, again, we've been very, very wet across the region with all the rain that's fallen since the start of September. So we are above normal for the, both the 90 day and the 180 day period. Uh, this more than compensated for the dry summer that we had. Uh, again, that's reflected here in the 180 day rainfall graphic, which does incorporate much of the summertime period. And we are now above normal for the year since January 1st for pretty much all locations across the region. So the drought outlook, again, that rain since the start of September has completely erased our drought conditions. The bottom right here shows you the drought monitor that was released at the end of August. And you can see that we were in drought, either dry or in drought across almost the entirety of the region with some even severe drought across the Rio Grande areas and then up into the hill country across uh, Gillespie and Llano counties. But then now here, this is the drought monitor from last week, and you can see absolutely zero drought concerns at all across the region. Looking at the U.S. seasonal drought outlook, we are not expecting drought conditions to redevelop this winter, so it looks like we're in good shape in that regard. So let's look at the shorter term outlooks that are produced by the Climate Prediction Center. This is the 6 to 10 and the 8 to 14 day outlooks. So we're looking at here December 16th all the way through the 24th of December, Christmas Eve. And the Climate Prediction Center is pretty confident that we're going to see above normal temperatures during this time period. Um, and pretty confident, slightly less so, but still confident that we're going to see above normal precipitation during that time period from the 16th of December up through the 24th of December. But as we go into long term here, as, we're, uh, as we head toward the rest of the wintertime months, January, February, um, a large impact on what we're going to see is going to come from uh, El Nino. So right now, we currently have ENSO neutral conditions. Uh, however, if you look here, October observed our uh, sea surface temperature anomaly is at about 0.8, 0.9 which does put us into El Nino, but we haven't seen that for three months now, so it technically is still in so neutral. Uh, but again, equatorial sea surface temperatures are above average across much of the Pacific Ocean. The ENSO alert system status is an El Nino watch, and the Climate Prediction Center predicts about an 80% chance for El Nino onset during the winter. Now we're only looking at a weak to moderate El Nino here, basically between 0.5 and 1.5 sea surface temperature anomalies. So we're not expecting a strong El Nino, but a weak to moderate. And then the Climate Prediction Center predicts a 55 to 60 percent chance for El Nino to continue into the spring of 2019. So what are the impacts of El Nino for our area here in South Central Texas during the winter time? So typically what we see is with the El Nino pattern in the wintertime, it displaces our polar jet north, and we actually get a more active subtropical jet. So a more active subtropical jet typically means more storm systems impacting the region. 
and this typically translates to what are the normal conditions for the winter time. Uh, temperatures are generally cooler, uh, however we see a lot of increased cloudiness from this unsettled weather pattern uh, and that typically translates to colder daytime highs, but it can also on the flip side of that give us uh, warmer nighttime lows because of that cloud cover. It can sometimes favor increased threat for winter precipitation and it seems to favor an increase in severe weather activity and I'm going to break down all of these aspects here in more detail in the uh, forthcoming slides. So in terms of precip and temperatures, uh, winter in south central Texas is typically wetter and cooler during El Nino. Uh, the strength of El Nino does seem to have a decent size impact on the effect of these changes in temperature and precipitation. Uh, however, I will note that winter of 2015-2016 we had a very strong El Nino and it actually ended up being relatively warm and dry across the region. So it's not like this holds every single time, but it's just kind of the trend. The majority of the time that we see El Nino, we typically see cooler and wetter conditions. But again, it doesn't hold 100% of the time. And this winter, we're expecting a weak to moderate El Nino. So again, looking at temperatures here, we typically see less freeze days. That's this graphic here on the left. Uh, less free days, but on the flip side of that, less very warm days, so that would be highs 80 degrees or above. Um, so again, seems like warmer nighttime temperatures, but cooler daytime temperatures from this increased cloud cover. Precipitation, we typically see more precipitation days and heavy precipitation days during El Nino winters. So on the left here, we have precipitation days of a hundredth of an inch or more, so any kind of measurable rainfall at all. And then heavy precipitation days, so a half an inch of rain or more. And again, you can see the trend holds that we typically see more of these days during El Nino winters compared to non-El Nino, winter, oh, non Nino winters, so either La Nina or neutral. Looking at snow, this is a little bit more complicated. Most of South Central Texas shows above average snow during El Nino winters. That is this graphic right here. This is all El Nino winters since 1950, showing you all events. And across our region, typically we see a little bit above average snow. However, it does seem to depend a little bit upon the strength of El Nino. Um, this graphic here shows you snow during the 10 strongest El Nino events. And this then expands basically to all of South Central Texas in terms of the above average snowfall across the region during the 10 strongest El Nino events. But then when you look at the 10 weakest El Nino winters, it kind of seems to reverse that course. And most of South Central Texas shows below average snow. Um, I will note again that winter of 2015, 2016, we did have a very strong El Nino and we actually did not see a snowfall event across the region. Um, I also will note that our sample size isn't particularly robust. We're only looking at about 20 um, events here, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but uh, typically, it seems like the increase in snow is more favored when we have the stronger El Nino events versus the weaker El Nino events. Furthermore, in terms of the snowfall, this is actually looking at our climate sites at Austin, San Antonio, and Del Rio. And we have seen a slight increase in snowfall occurrence during El Nino winters at Austin and San Antonio, or I'm sorry, Austin and Del Rio. Here, this is percent of years with snowfall for El Nino years versus all others since 1950. And this has been updated to reflect the most recent winters. And in Austin, there's not a whole lot of difference here in terms of a percent of years for the El Nino with snowfall versus all others or all years. Uh, same with Del Rio. However, we do seem to see a large increase in snowfall occurrence during El Nino winters at San Antonio, where 8 out of 19 El Nino winters since 1950 had measurable snowfall at San Antonio. Moving on now to severe weather. Uh, local research shows that we have more wintertime severe weather events during El Nino winters across our area. So the top left graphic here shows the average number of combined severe weather events during the wintertime. So you can see a large increase here in El Nino versus La Nina and then neutral. And uh, these typically tend to show more for tornado reports or tornado events and hail events um, rather than wind. 
Uh, also, research from Greg Carbon, formerly of SPC, also suggests a higher frequency of severe weather events across South Central Texas during El Nino winters, uh, especially for areas along and east of the Interstate 35 corridor. And again, this isn't particularly surprising given the more active subtropical jet during the wintertime and El Nino winters. Moving on now to flooding, flash flooding, river flooding. Uh, we definitely see a higher prevalence of flash flooding events across our region during El Nino winters. Here on the left, you can see that. This is the average number of flash flood events during winter across South Central Texas. And you can see much more of these in El Nino versus La Nina or neutral winters. And this even excludes the winter of 1991, 1992, which saw a lot of flash flooding. And that was actually an El Nino event as well. And then looking at the wintertime precipitation during El Nino, the increased risk of wet or dry extremes, you can see for our area here a large percent increase in the risk of extreme precipitation events. So what does the Climate Prediction Center have uh, outlooked for us for the wintertime? Temperatures, they put even chances, so no strong signal for temperatures uh, for the winter months um, one way or the other but they do have us tilted toward above normal precipitation for the winter time as you can see here on this image on the bottom right looking at the fire weather outlook again we've seen that well above normal precipitation since september and we continue to, to expect above normal precipitation through the winter time um, the energy release component these uh, graphs here on the right remain below average uh, the National Interagency Fire Center predicts near normal or below normal significant wildland fire potential for the winter season. This is the January outlook and then this is the February outlook and you can see we are below normal for January and again below normal with a few areas near normal um, for the significant wildland fire potential outlook. However, we do have some fuels that are cured due to the recent hard freezes that we've had. Back in mid to late November, we got down to the low 20s across the region. So that has cured some of those fuels, especially a lot of the grasses. Uh, so I want to stress that we could still see brief periods of elevated to critical fire conditions, especially behind our strong cold fronts in which we pair those high winds with low relative humidity values. And in fact, we expect something like that to occur on Thursday of this week after that strong cold front that's going to move through um, Thursday morning and early afternoon. So wrapping things up, synthesizing everything we've talked about here in this outlook, um, we're going to kind of highlight what we expect for the impacts in the winter season. So for heavy rain, flash flooding, and river flooding, we do expect um, above normal impacts due to the antecedent wet conditions that we've seen and the likelihood of what are the normal conditions persisting, as well as what we've seen in El Nino winters in the past here with the increased prevalence of flash flood events and that increased risk of extreme precipitation events. For severe weather, we are hedging near or slightly above normal impacts. Uh, again, that's mostly based upon what we've seen in the past with El Nino winters. <clears throat> Looking at some of the longer term models, we don't really see anything extreme on the horizon in terms of severe weather, but based upon what we've seen in the past with El Nino winters, um, you know, with the more active subtropical jet, and the increased prevalence of severe weather events, we are hedging that slightly above normal. And then for winter weather, again, hedging that toward near or slightly above normal impacts as well, but a little bit closer toward the normal line there. Uh, and that's based upon what we've seen in the past with El Nino winters. But again, I have low confidence in this, um, mainly because it seems like it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, especially since we're only going to be in a weak to moderate El Nino. I'm not sure if that trend is going to hold so much that we've seen uh, with the stronger El Ninos with the increased snowfall. But I will hedge that just a little bit slightly above normal impacts for the winter weather. Uh, one thing I want to point out here, though, is that, you know, I'm, I'm saying we're going to see above normal or expecting you know, high, higher likelihood of above normal impacts. Well, the normal impacts for the winter is very, very minimal for all these things. Heavy rain, flash flooding, river flooding, severe weather, and winter weather. You know, we typically don't get much rain in the winter time, so we don't really see much flooding. We don't get much severe weather in the winter time, and we don't really get winter weather that often here. So normal impacts would be very minimal for 
for these things. So just because I'm hedging them toward above normal doesn't mean I expect extreme events or anything, but I'm just saying that, you know, if anything, we would expect to see above normal impacts for these. So it's important to view this in the light of, of the proper context about what we typically see during these seasons um, so you can kind of get the better idea for what we expect. But again, expecting above normal impacts for all of these items. And then for fire weather, we're expecting uh, a little bit below normal impacts from wildland fires, again, due to the antecedent wet conditions and the above normal precipitation expected to continue. But again, I will stress that we will still likely see periods of elevated to critical fire conditions still existing. And again, we expect to see that again this week on Thursday behind that strong cold front where we have strong northerly winds and low relative humidity values. And again, we do have some uh, cured fuels out there that could... Um, could be combustible. That. But anyway, um, with that, I will end the webinar. I will take any questions that you guys have now. I thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can contact our office directly here at this phone number. That's our public line. Or you can contact me directly via email. Or you can visit our website at weather.gov, gov, gov slash Austin or slash San Antonio.